Every soul is destined to be perfect. Every soul is destined to be perfect. And every being, in the end, will attain that state of perfection. Whatever we are now is the result or the result of our acts and thoughts in the past. And whatever we shall be in the future will be the result of what we think and do now. But this, the shaping of our own destinies, does not preclude our receiving help from outside. Nay, in the vast majority of cases, such help is absolutely necessary. When it comes, oops. <laughs> when it comes, the higher powers and possibilities of the soul, when it comes, the higher powers and possibilities of the soul are quickened. Spiritual life is awakened, growth is animated, and man becomes holy and perfect in the end. This quickening impulse cannot be derived from books. The soul can only receive impulses from another soul and from nothing else. We may study books all our lives. We may become very intellectual. But in the end, we find that we have not developed at all spiritually. This inadequacy of books to quicken spiritual growth is the reason why, although every one of us can speak most wonderfully spiritual matters on spiritual matters, when it comes to action and the living of a truly spiritual life, we find oursel ourselves so awfully deficient to quicken the spirit to quicken the spirit, the impulse must come from another soul. Today is a very, very important day, especially for those who are who follow the Vedic traditions. It's Guru Purnima. Happy Guru Purnima to all of you. And on a very special day, we have a very special guest. Our lecturer today is Swami Sarva Priyananda. He is the minister of the Vedanta Society of New York. He doesn't need an introduction. We all know him. The topic today is Heart of Awareness. Om Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwara Guru Reva Param Brahma Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Om Tapakaya Chadharmasya Sarva Dharmasva Rubini Avatar of Arishthaya Rava Krishna Yate Namaha Good morning. It's certainly nice to be back here. Um, today, being Guru Purnima, in the Vedic tradition, the Guru is central. The Guru is the teacher. And the teacher is central because in the Vedantic tradition, knowledge is central. The teacher transmits knowledge. And through knowledge comes liberation. Today, we will speak of only the highest truth. Once Sri Ramakrishna was asked, can you give me spirituality in one sentence? Whoever asked was a wise person. He knows of the existence of volumes and volumes of books and talks and talks. So he said, one sentence, I'm going to allow you one sentence. Can you give me spirituality in one sentence? And Sri Ramakrishna said, Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance. Think about this. And he kept quiet. He just said, think about it and kept quiet. According to him, this is spirituality in a sense. Just this one sentence. 
Now in an entirely different setting, in Central Park in New York, I go there for a walk almost every day, and you come across, there's the Dakota where Yoko Ono still lives, and on the other side, there are these aging hippies, <laughs> the last remnants of a wonderful age. Uh, they, 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 are, they are sitting there, and one of them, I mean, I have interesting conversations with them sometimes. I go dressed like this, so they look at me. Almost uh, inevitably, somebody does a namaste to me. And one day, one of them looked at me and she said, Hey, you look like the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> and another day, another of them said, Hey, if you could tell me one thing, what would it be? So that this is one thing that we are going to talk about this morning. Just one thing. And we will talk about it from the highest book, the, the final teaching of, of Vedanta, of Advaita Vedanta. There is this slim volume called Ashtavakra Sanghita. It's possibly the, the final statement. Beyond that, there lies only silence. You can't go any further than that. So the sage Ashtavakra speaks to the Emperor Janaka and teaches the Emperor Janaka. This was a book that Sri Ramakrishna would not allow anybody else to read. He would keep it hidden and he would ask Narendra Vivekananda. When the young man would come to him, he would say, you read this. And Narendra would say, well, what's this? Everything is God. The pots and pans are God. This is crazy. <laughs> and Ramakrishna would say, oh, you don't have to believe in it. Just, just read it out for my sake. Just read it to me. And he would close the doors and windows so that nobody would uh, listen to that. Only for Vivekananda. And that Vivekananda, who thought it was crazy, he would come to this country years later and broadcast it openly. There are a number of lectures in which when you read it and you read the Ashtavakra Sanghita, you see that Vivekananda is just translating directly. Very lucid, nice translation, but just translating directly. In, its, um, in a more recent translation, Thomas Byron, who was trained in Oxford and was a professor of English in this country until recently, till he passed away. He has, I think, the best English translation. Um, and that's where I've taken the name from, the name of today's talk, the heart of awareness. So in the introduction to his translation of Ashtavakra, he writes very beautifully. He says, when all the scriptures of the world have fallen silent, when everything has, that has to be said has been said, when all that has to be taught has been taught, and they, they all fall silent, Ashtavakra begins. He says the words in this book, they scarcely touch the paper. They seem so luminous. They appear from light and appear before you and disappear back from the light they have come from. It's really true. It's like... It's so direct that when you read the book, it's like looking directly at the sun. It's, it can be very uncomfortable because there is only one thing that Ashtavakra says again and again and again. There is no clever philosophy there, no subtle argumentation, no effort at arguing anything. The man, he sees a, a spiritual vision and he tries his best to communicate it to us. That's all. The language is not difficult. It's in Sanskrit, but it's the simplest Sanskrit that you will see. Very simple, very lucid, very powerful language, very direct language. You cannot doubt that here is a person who has seen, who lives the truth. The truth is continuously available to this person. So that's the text I'm going to use. And I'm going to take only one verse from it. Only one verse. It's a small volume. Only one verse from that text. And we're going to talk about it this morning. It's at the very beginning of this text where Ashtavakra, the sage, tells the emperor Janaka. Um, it's, I think, the third, the fourth verse. It goes something like this. Yadi deham pritakritya chiti vishram yatishthasi adhuneva sukhi shanto bandhamuk don't worry about the Sanskrit. That's the last you're going to hear about it. Now, but it's beautiful Sanskrit. I'll translate. And we will dwell upon each word of this, of this verse. Each word is so powerful. 
the translation runs like this. If you separate yourself from the body and abide in pure consciousness, right now, right here, you will attain the ultimate bliss, you will attain permanent peace and freedom from all bondage. That's the verse. If you separate yourself from your body, abide in pure consciousness, right now you are going to attain the ultimate bliss, permanent peace and be free of bondage forever. This is the verse. Let's look at this more carefully. The first word itself is important. If. If. Why is this important? You see, there, is, there are two approaches to this. There is a kind of, uh, there is something I, I would like to call conventional religiosity. And there is true spirituality. And in true spirituality also, there is the highest form which Ashtavakra speaks about, which we shall talk about this morning. Conventional spirituality is, conventional religiosity would be, um, God is nice, religion is nice, it's part of life. You're going to have a good life, religion plays its part. It's like a car is nice, it's a convenience, a washing machine is nice, it's a convenience, a dishwasher is nice, it's a convenience, God is also nice, a convenience. God helps us. It gives us the strength, uh, God gives us the strength of faith. If you have faith in God, you get strength to live life, you know, a support, a place of refuge. God grants our prayers. And the prayers are usually to do with the world. You know, I, any, it could be anything from, I need money, or I, I don't want to be fired. If I'm fired, let me find another job. Or let me just find parking. It could be <laughs> the whole range of prayers we have. And all of them are worldly. They're all worldly. They're not wrong. They're not wrong. But they're all to do with our life in the world. And most of religion is this kind of conventional religiosity. If you see the huge crowds in temples or in some of the churches you see, most of them are not there for nirvana. They are not there for enlightenment. They are mostly there. They want peace of mind. They want uh, uh, you know, to dwell in the presence of God for some time, to get the strength to carry on with their lives. Nothing wrong in that at all. Nothing wrong. They want diseases to be cured, degrees to be obtained, lost people to be found, um, unpleasant people to get rid of. So, <laughs> all sorts of things, but again, all to do with the world. I want to distinguish this from real spirituality, what I call real spirituality. What is real spirituality? Do you want God realization? Do you want nirvana? Do you want enlightenment? Do you want moksha? Do you want the highest samadhi? Do you want the ecstasy of divine love in the, um, in the love of Krishna or Christ? The highest ecstasy. That is real spirituality. The distinction is this. Is God there to make my life better? Is God there for my life? Or is my life for God? Is it religion for to make my life better? Or my life is there to realize the highest truths of spirituality and religion? This is the distinction that I am making. You see, what happens often is, if uh, God does not fulfill his obligations, I prayed and prayed to God and he did not answer, so I don't believe in God anymore. God is laid off, God is fired, didn't do his job. That's when God is there for helping me. It's not just God. You might say, I don't believe in God. Well, it might be yoga. I'm doing yoga. Why am I doing yoga? I can, um, uh, I'll be more flexible. I can be younger for longer. And I can, my digestion will improve. My the skin, the tone of my skin will be better. All valid reasons for doing yoga. Good. But that's not the ultimate purpose of yoga. You can. You can do all of that. It is, I, I do meditation because I'm stressed out. I need relief from stress. Again, a valid reason for doing meditation, but not the highest purpose of meditation. When Maharshi Mahesh Yogi in this country 
And he said something very clever. He, he came to this country and he taught transcendental meditation. And the benefits of transcendental meditation were touted it again in the 60s, 70s. And you, you get relief from anxiety, you get stress relief, you, you, well, the aging process is delayed and your immunity is boosted. And many of these things actually have been verified in medical studies, in papers. There is uh, Harvey Benson, whose uh, uh, famous paper on the relaxation response showed medically how meditation does actually help us to relax. All true. But when the Swami went back to India, other Swamis asked him, what are you doing? That's not the purpose of meditation. What are you telling them? And he said, that's what he said, something clever. He said, I give them what they want in the hope that they will want what I want to give them. <laughs> you see? Eventually, I hope they'll come around. Why will they come around? Because no matter how much yoga you do, how much gluten-free you eat, how much... <laughs> yes. California leads, so <laughs> it's just sort of coming on the East Coast. There are gluten-free foods coming up there and they're catching up. <laughs> no matter how much you pray, one day death will come, old age will come, disease is in inevitable, disappointment in life is inevitable. I prayed to God and he cured my disease, my cancer. Great. But you know, the skeptic in me says that God gave you the cancer in the first place. It's a big deal he cured it. <laughs> and and, and, and there, are not, there are thousands of cases where God does not cure it. You say, oh, they didn't pray. Some of them did. Or their close ones, their, their loved ones did pray. It didn't work. So the skeptic in me asks this. That... Ultimately, all of this, this struggling to hold on to this evanescent life of ours, it will come to an end with or without God. It's not satisfying, finally. A mature soul, a sensitive soul, seeks something higher. So if you seek something higher, is there an ultimate solution to the human problem? Can permanent bliss and peace be found? Can suffering be transcended? Buddha's quest, all is suffering. Is there a way out of suffering? Can that be done? If that is your quest, that's what Ashtavakra means. If. That's a deep if. When he says, come to me, Ashtavakra says, and I have something to say to you. If not, go on. Go on with your life. Live wisely or otherwisely. If you live otherwisely, unhappy. If you live wisely, happy. Not, not too bad. Life will go on. It's okay. If it's okay, if it's acceptable to you, go on. I have nothing to say to you. Ashtavakra falls silent. But if you seek the highest spirituality, then come to me. I have something to say to you. Alan Watts, who is in San Francisco, uh, in his inimitable, witty way, he made a comment once. If religion is indeed the opium of the masses then the Hindus certainly seem to have the inside dope. <laughs> Ashtavakra is going to give us the inside dope. If you can separate yourself from your body, let's go a little forward. Body, what does he mean with the body? He says, pay attention to yourself now. Take a look at your experience of yourself. You see the body here, the physical body. Here is the body. And look within, you will find something subtler. You will find the breath. Look subtler, look even more de deeper inside. You will find the mind, thoughts, ideas, emotions, the personality, what you consider yourself to be, the me in this body. <clears throat> you will find that too. Memories. All of that you find. Look even deeper, you try to go beyond the mind. And you find, for example, in deep sleep, when the, you're not aware of the body, when you're not aware of the mind, there's a blankness. Now consider these three. The physical body, which you see here. In Vedanta, they call it the gross body. Not because it's gross, it can be very fine, very fit, very healthy, but gross in the sense of physical. The physical body. And inside that, Vedanta speaks of a subtle body. No theory here. Just look, you'll find it. 
the biological process is going on, the life force is called prana. Deeper than that, you find the mind, the emotions, the ideas. So you see, that is called the subtle body. And beyond that, Vedanta speaks of a causal body. Why it's called a causal body, we need not bother. In fact, we need not bother with the causal body right now for our purposes. It's this physical body and the subtle body, the body-mind complex that we consider ourselves to be. If you ask, who are you? I'll say, I'm Swami Sarvapriyana. And you say, no, 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 you point yourself out. Who are you? Where? I'll say, here, this one. So I consider this thing to be me and whatever is going on inside it to be me. This physical body and the person inside to be me. And Vedanta says, you are wrong. <coughs> you are not this body. Neither the physical body, nor the subtle body. You're not the body, you're not even the mind. There was an article in Wall Street Journal a few years back um, on the 150th birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda. Uh, and this, uh, the author, Annie Bardak, she writes that most people don't, haven't heard of Vivekananda in the modern age, but everybody has heard of the legacy of Vivekananda. For example, if you've heard of yoga, it's... Uh, it's one of the gifts that Vivekananda bought from the East. But if Vivekananda, she goes on to write, if Vivekananda were to look at the yoga studios there and the cult of worshipping the body, he would say something that would shock most yoga practitioners. He would say, you are not the body. And then he would go on to say something even more shocking. You are not the mind. You are not the body, not the mind. In fact, he, Vedanta says our bondage, our suffering, our entire problem is because we think, not think, we are convinced that we are the body-mind complex, that we could be anything else, we don't even consider that, it's just not possible, I am this, that's perfect, I don't, I'm, that's just obvious, I don't give it a second thought, like Mark Twain said, it's not what we do not know that gets us into trouble, it's what we know that it just ain't so, that's what gets us into trouble. We are the body and something beyond the body just ain't so. Vedanta says it is so and proceeds in no uncertain fashion to point out how we are not the body. Vedanta says you have to see yourself, you have to get this clarity, this conviction, this seeing that you are not the body. How? How do you do that? Let's dwell a little bit on that. I'm going to give you a series, just a selection of the Vedantic thinking, the arguments to show that we are actually not the body and can be profoundly unsettling. But I'm going to do it anyway because you're here for the highest truth. <laughs> so we're going to separate ourselves from the body right now, right here. And separating ourselves from the body does not mean that you, like a puff of smoke, you'll come out of your left ear, left ear or something like that. Here I am. There's the body. Here I am. Not even an out-of-body experience. I'm drifting up to the ceiling. I can see my body sitting there. No, 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 no. It's more like when you know that you are separate from your clothes, do you need to jump out of your clothes because you're separate from your clothes? Of course not. You can still continue to wear your clothes. When you realize that you're separate from your car, do you need to stop driving your car? Of course not. You can very well. In fact, then only you can drive your car perfectly. You are separate from the car. You are not the car. You can use the car. Everybody who has ever enlightened, whether it's Ramana Maharshi or Ramakrishna, whether it's Christ or Krishna, all of them very evidently continue to be in the body, acting through the body and communicating with us through the body, clearly. So separating ourselves from the body does not mean giving up the body, leaving the body, not using the body, not at all. You will just go on like this, you need not be afraid. But what happens is we realize we are not the body, we are something much more than the body. How do you do that? Now I am going to give you some Vedantic dope to show you, to give that clari clarity, to see right now, here and now, that I am not the body. I will give you a selection, let's say five arguments. At one level, they are intellectual arguments which we need to hear and understand. But at a deeper level, they are, they are pointers. They are pointers. Pointers in what sense? I'm going to show them separately and say, see, you're expected to see that you are not the body. Let's see. Five arguments I'll give you. Five pointers. One, 
The first one, the one, is that we always see ourselves as one, not as multiple. Do you think you are a person or do you think you are a committee? I think I'm one person. Even if a person has multiple personality disorder and has dozens of multiple personalities <laughs> and multiple personalities, even then only one at a time. Doesn't think I am a committee. You do not have parts. You are one. You are a unit. You are an identity. Now look at the body. It has parts. Hands and legs and head and belly and and organs and tissues and cells, millions and millions of parts. How can that which is a composite and you are convinced that you are not a composite? At this point you might say that, no Swami, I have parts. Look, I have a body and hands and feet. Whatever you think of as your parts, if you look at that, if you point out your parts, your, your components, you will see it's either the body or the mind. I have thoughts. I have different kinds of ideas. So they are in the mind. Is that you or the mind? Whenever you see, if you see yourself as composed of parts, you will say the parts definitely belong to either the body or the mind. Is that not so? Am I making sense here? I am one, the body is a composite of many. That which is an identity and that which is a composite cannot be the same thing. It's virtually impossible. One argument and a pointer. Second one. I am basically unchanging and the body continuously changes. For the, for the time being, let, let me, the unchanging, keep it aside and notice the fact that the body changes. It's an obvious fact. Throughout our lives, the tiny little baby. And look at you now. If you have the photographs of, the, uh, of you side by side, even your mom wouldn't be able to recognize you. What a huge difference, physically, a tremendous difference. You are larger, different, you look different, you have different capacities, all those things have developed, the body has changed. It grows from babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to old age, decays and dies. This is so. You, you claim that I was that baby. I was that child. I was that teenager. I am this middle-aged person or this old person. You don't say that baby was somebody else and the child was somebody else and this person somebody else. Obviously not. Sounds silly. Such a simple fact. But that I, unchanging I, you say, no Swami, I have changed. I've changed so much. But again, if you, if you want, want to point out those changes, you will see all those changes are either in the body or in the mind. They are in the body. They are in the personality. You will say, but I am the person, right? Are you? The very word person means a mask. It comes from an ancient Greek usage where in, in the ancient Greek theatres, Actors would go out on stage and hold these big masks of each character and the, the, the masks had funnels and the actors would speak through the funnel so that the voice would carry and people at the distance would know which character is, uh, uh, is there on stage. In fact, the very word persona, sona means sound, through which sound comes literally. It's a mask used for acting and that's what we call personality. It's not you. It's the mask, it's not me, it's the mask that I, the awareness, wear and present myself to the world. That mask can change, it does change. But you, the wearer of the mask, did not change. You are unchanging, the body is continuously changing. The physical body is changing, the subtle body is changing. In fact, the physical body is changing every day. New cells are formed, old cells that in their tens of thousands, in their millions, is shedding cells and generating new cells. Minds change. How enormously our minds have changed. Remember what you were like when you were a teenager, little, little boy or little girl? What you thought of? What was your knowledge? What was your idea about the world? What did you like? What did you dislike? What did you want in life? And look at your mind now. There is a great difference. 
minds have changed. If the mind has changed so much, it could be another person's mind, and yet you say, that was my mind, and this is my mind now. That's what I thought then, this is what I think now. Then the I who thought like that then, and the I who thinks like that now, must be the same I, unchanging. When you are unchanging, and the body is changing, body is the name of physic a stream of physical changes, the mind is the name of a stream of subtle mental changes. You, the unchanging, and the body, the changing, how can they be one and the same? They cannot be one and the same. Second pointer, this is the second pointer. That I am basically unchanging. My life reveals that to me. What I consider to be changing about myself is either the body or the mind, the personality that has changed. Third, it's a very simple argument. I always consider myself to be where? Where do you consider yourself to be in respect to the body? Just feel it now. Do you consider yourself to be, here's the body and if you ask me, Swami, I'm here in the pocket. No. You'll always say I'm somewhere within the body. Is it not so? Is it not so? I always consider myself to be as a felt experience that I am within. I'm somewhere in here. If you force me, if you press me to point out a location, I might say I'm here. Or I might say I'm here somewhere, not out there. In that case, look at this, a simple fact. All of us, we have this experience and yet, yet we do not notice this. We always feel we are inner. Compared to us, the body is outer. That which is external, that which is internal, how can they be one and the same? I'll repeat that. That which is in here and that which is out here, how can they be one and the same? Third reason, you are always inert to the body. The body is always experienced as being external to you. What do you say about yourself? I am embodied in here. Therefore, you are in there somewhere and this body is somewhere out around you. Right? Simple, ex uh, it, it sounds uh, childish, this uh, kind of thinking, but it, there's no way of getting around it. It's a fact and we do not notice it. Third argument, third pointer. We are separating ourselves carefully from the body in our understanding, not physically. I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to use tweezers, Vedantic tweezers to pull you out of your body. <laughs> no, in our understanding. Now let's go a little deeper. The body is an object of perception. You're always the subject. You're always the seer and the body is the scene. It's just like, I see this table and the microphone and the lamp. They're all objects. I see them. The eyes are the seer and the objects are seen. And the seer and the seen are always different. They cannot be the same thing. In fact, the eyes which see this world, the only thing that they cannot see are the eyes themselves. You, the awareness in the body, you're always aware of the body. You are the seer and the body is the seen. Hence, you cannot be the body. I'll repeat that again. The seer and the seen are always different. The subject and the object are always different. And we are very clear when it comes to the world here. I don't think I am a tree or, a, or, uh, or that brick wall. I don't even think that I am you. Because you are all objects to my eyes. They are all different. But how strange when it comes to the body. It's both an ob object and we behave as if it were the subject. I say my body weighs so many pounds. Or I say I weigh so many pounds. You see the duality here. You never say the book weighs or the suitcase weighs so many pounds in the airport. Or you, do, uh, or you might as well say officer I weigh so many pounds. No. When you're weighing the suitcase for checking luggage, how much does it weigh? You say officer the suitcase weighs so many pounds. Do you ever say... We could just as well say, I weigh so many pounds, and that, 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 that's my weight too. No. An object is always an object. But when the body, when it comes to the body, we treat it sometimes as an object, sometimes as, 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 as a subject itself. But clearly, in your experience, do you see the body? You say, yes. Do you feel the body? Yes. And sometimes you do even, even smell the body, unfortunately. 
So all our sense organs can objectify the body. You can see it, hear it, smell it, um, touch it, taste it, all of it. It's an object for all our sense organs. How can it be the subject? How can it be the seer? You are the seer, the body is the seen, hence the two cannot be the same. Seer and seen. It's a very profound uh, observation. Fourth. And the last one. You are awareness. You are consciousness. You are always, you always see yourself as an, as an aware entity. As a conscious entity. And the body is non-conscious. The body is non-conscious. It seems to be conscious. That's the trick. It's non-conscious because it seems to be conscious because you are present in the body. That's why it seems to be conscious. But it is not conscious. A simple experiment will show that. Uh, in New York, there is a psychologist, Greg Good. Uh, he is also very, very much into Vedanta. He's written wonderful books on psychology and Vedanta. He proposes this simple experiment. He said, just look at your, look at your, uh, your hand. Just try it now. Just try it now. Look at your hand. And he says, ask yourself this question. What is my experience? Is my experience that I am looking at the hand or I am aware of the hand? Or is my experience the hand is aware of me? <laughs> that would be creepy. <laughs> huh? His hand says, hello there. <laughs> Never. When you look at the arm, look, look at the hand, all the, always, I am aware of the hand. Clearly, I am aware of this. This is never aware of, aware of me. Take a look at the other hand, same experience. Take a look at, look at your uh, foot or your tummy or your chest or your head. Same experience. You are aware of it. It is not aware of you. Subtle point, but a very simple point. Is that not true? Then the body is just a combination of these hands and feet and belly and tummy and legs. None of them are individually aware of you. The collection cannot be aware of you. You are the one aware of it. Clearly, you are conscious. It is not. You are conscious of it. You never feel that the body is aware of something. You are aware of something and sometimes you may be aware of something through the body. Fifth argument. And there are many, many more. But let's quickly sum up. You might be thinking, what was the first one? Don't worry, I'll, I'll remind you. I'll remind you. All of them are trying to, these are different ways of pointing out the same thing, that you are not the body. Though you may be in the body, you may be using the body, but you are not the body. One, you are one and the body is a composite of many. In Sanskrit, ekam anekam. You are, the second one is that you are Always uh, in, inside. No, you are unchanging. Nirvikara. In Sanskrit, nirvikara. And the body is continuously changing. Savikara. Nirvikara, savikara in Sanskrit. Third, you are always experienced as inside the body and the body is always experienced as outside you. Or rather, around you. Inner and outer. How can they be the same? In Sanskrit, pratyak parak. Pratyak parak. Then the fourth one, you are always the seer and the body is always seen, is experienced. So you are drashta, the body is drishya, Sanskrit drashta and drishya. The two cannot be the same, never are the same in our experience. And the last one is that the body is always insentient, you are always sentient. You are chit according to Vedanta and the body is what is called jara. Chit jara. Because of these five reasons and many more reasons. Dwell on any one of them or more of them or all of them and meditate and, and just see. Clearly you are not the body. Then if I'm not the body, what am I? It says abiding in pure consciousness. Now what is this pure consciousness? According to Vedanta, we are existence consciousness bliss. Now this word seem familiar to us, but there is a trap hidden there. Because the why the word seem familiar to us is because we are we we have experience of existence and the existence of things. Here the table exists, the body exists, this wall exists, you all exist. 
we have experience of the existence of things, but we do not experience existence in itself. If at all, what could it be? It sounds very awfully abstract. What do you mean by existence itself? Consciousness. We have experience of conscious experiences. I have the experience of seeing, I have the experience of hearing, I have the experience of talking, smelling, walking, remembering, suffering, enjoying. These are what we call conscious experiences. But if I say consciousness in itself, pure consciousness, what could that be? Not an experience of something, just ex the consciousness itself. Bliss. We have experience of, of uh, happy experiences, you know, joys and pleasures and little, little nice things happening to us in, in life. That's our experience of happiness, the stream of number of happy experiences. But bliss itself, joy itself, ananda, what could it be? This such chit ananda, which is not actually an object of experience, Vedanta says, that's what you are. Vivekananda said, it's not that the absolute Brahman is, is uh, it, not that it exists, it is existence itself. Not that it is, it knows something, it is knowledge itself. Not that it is happy, it is happiness itself. That is manifested in this world as things existing, as conscious experiences, as the search for happiness and a variety of little happy, happy experiences of our life. But the unlimited existence consciousness bliss is within us, is actually we ourselves. If that sounds awfully abstract, try this. Try this. Separate yourself from everything objective right now in your understanding. Do it this way. There are many techniques. I'll give you one. Whatever is in front of you are objects, clearly not you. Right? Whatever is each of you individually, whatever is in front of you, whatever you see, they are objects, clearly not you. Then come back to the body. If you agree with me, those five arguments, pointers, clearly the body is also an object, an intimate object, but not me. Look inside. Thoughts, ideas, memories, the personality which I consider to be myself. It all floats up. Or it doesn't float up. But it's there then. But clearly it is experienced. If it is experienced, it's an object of experience. Clearly not me. Then you go further back. If you go further back, many of you more sensitive, you'll say, I'm running up against a blankness, Swami. A blankness. Nothing. <coughs> if I step back from the mind, what's, there le what's left there? Blank. Follow carefully. What? experiences the blankness. Clearly the blankness is experienced. What experiences the blankness? What is it which experiences this waking world? You're sitting here in your waking world as this particular person, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, and you experience this hall and this, all the people around. Hopefully you're awake, if you're awake. Because Vedanta often has a soporific effect. <laughs> but if you're sleeping also, if you're sleeping, you're dreaming maybe of listening to a Vedanta talk. There too, what is the one thing which experiences the dream world? And if you're in deep sleep, no experience, the blankness of deep sleep. And yet that blankness is experienced. What is the one thing which experiences your waking personality and your waking world, your dream personality and your dream world, and deep sleep blankness, one continuous. Because after all, you do claim, it is I who was awake, it is I who dreamt, it is I who was in deep sleep, it is I who have woken up. Do you not claim, you don't claim that the waker and the dreamer and the deep sleeper are three different persons. No, it's you. What continues? Like a golden thread through our days and nights. It's not an objective consciousness. Objects keep changing. Another example. The eyes. You see, everything here is seen by the eyes, except the eyes themselves. 
it's not an all these are objects for these eyes but the eyes themselves are not out there now if you say what is the proof that all these people were present and i say i saw them so seeing somebody is the proof of presence then i do not see my eyes then i have to say the eyes are absent do you see the logic if i say that what is the proof that all these proof people were present i saw them so seeing somebody is the proof that the person is present then the eyes themselves and never see them so i have no proof that i have got eyes but no the very fact that i am seeing somebody is proof that i have got eyes in the same way think of consciousness not as an object out there or in here but that in which all objects are experienced that is pure consciousness that's what you are the body changes it ages and dies consciousness does not age or die the mind changes sometimes depressed sometimes uh, bored sometimes happy sometimes sublime sometimes gross the mind changes consciousness is never depressed consciousness is never exhilarated consciousness is never bored it is the one illuminer of the bored mind of the excited mind of the depressed mind of the happy mind one unchanging light shining through our lives it is the sun which neither rises nor sets it is the light of the ages that's what pure consciousness is and then he says resting in that abide in pure ashtavakra we are still with that verse abiding in pure consciousness it's not difficult to understand what we have talked about so far it's not it's very simple actually it's very direct but then the problem will come and say swami i get it but i can't abide in it i can't stay in it the moment i walk out of the vedanta society into the free way or back home or in the office i am back in the body and the mind and this world and all its troubles pure consciousness whatever it is is completely disappeared from the scene it is not disappeared from the scene how do i abide in pure consciousness how do i abide as the silent witness of the of the drama of my life the advaita uh, ashtavakra tells us you don't have to do anything actually it is already accomplished you always abide it's just that you get mixed up with the mind it's the mind which says that i have to abide as pure consciousness the mind cannot abide as pure consciousness sometimes it might think about advaitic things and feel peaceful sometimes it does not think about spiritual things and feels restless but the restless mind and the peaceful mind both shine in the light of one pure consciousness which is ever restful which is never disturbed abiding in pure consciousness means in every experience of life good and bad religious and material spiritual and non spiritual in every experience of life happy or sad noting that it is the same pure consciousness shining through all of them all of those experiences are experienced in that one light just as the same pair of eyes experience everything see everything that you see in life in the kena upanishad it is said prati bodha viditam matam amritatvam hi bindyati but what it means is when you experience that pure consciousness in and through every experience you gain immortality after all what is mortality the body dies that's mortality the mind changes that's mortality that's change pure consciousness does not change once you realize that you don't hold on and grasp how do you grasp we grasp on to things by saying i am that or it's mine the problem is when i say something is mine i am trapped to i say this is mine i'm holding on to it what are you doing i'm holding on to it but it's also holding on to you you grasp a person a relationship a thing a pet a money um the body youth anything that you grasp on to that also tends to hold on to you and also it you will never ever succeed because all that is compounded will one day come apart everything shall shall pass away everything disintegrates and passes away the buddha he had it right though it little pessimistically when he said anityam anityam sarvam anityam 
transient, transient, indeed everything is transient. You say, okay, we know that, but if it lasts long enough, it's good for me. <laughs> a cookie, I know, it's impermanent. Who wants a permanent cookie anyway? <laughs> so it's impermanent. But as long as it gives me a flash of pleasure, it is okay for me. But the Buddha says, goes on further to say, Kshanikam, Kshanikam, Sarvam, Kshanikam. It's not only temporary, it's momentary. It lasts for just a split instant. The next instant looks like that. That's why we think there's a continuity. There's no continuity in life. And he goes on further to say, Shunyam, Shunyam, Sarvam, Shunyam. Void, void, all is void. And therefore, Dukkham, Dukkham, Sarvam, Dukkham. Suffering, suffering, all is suffering. In all these changes of life, when we recognize one consciousness in which all this is going on, and not try to grasp something, hold on to something. William Blake, the mystic, he had it right, the poet. He says, He who binds himself to a joy doth kill the winged life. You bind yourself to a joy, you kill the winged life. But he who kisses the joy as it flies, lives forever in eternity's sunrise. <clears throat> How can you kiss the joy as it flies? Or even the suffering. You can kiss the suffering also as it flies. You'll be happy to get rid of it. But don't worry, more is on the way. <laughs> yeah, they say that. And a pessimist is one who sees the dark tunnel ahead. And an optimist is the one who sees the light at the end of the tunnel. But a realist is one who sees the dark tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel and the next dark tunnel ahead. <laughs> That's the realism. How can you remain unattached? When you are rooted in your real nature as pure consciousness. When you abide in that. There's an interesting thing about abiding. One might get the sense that, okay, so I have to keep on reminding myself, I am pure consciousness, I am Brahman. I remember this conversation we had with a Vedantic teacher in, in the Himalayas sitting at his feet and other monks were there and one monk excitedly said, a young monk, to this the teacher, he said to the master in Hindi, but I'll tell you in English but at least this, this idea, this understanding that I am Brahman, I am pure consciousness, at least that much I must hold on to we think that, yeah, that's, that's, that, sound, that seems to be the teaching that's what Ashtavakra means, abiding in pure consciousness. And the master said immediately, that is what you must not hold on to. You see, what's happening here is like this. Imagine a play going on, an actor who acts as a king or acts as a beggar in the play. Now, does that actor keep reminding himself, look, I am Mr. XYZ, I'm the actor, I'm not a beggar, I'm not a beggar, I'm an actor, I'm an actor. Does the person think like that? I must not forget that I'm an actor, otherwise I'll be trapped as a beggar. No! He can happily forget his actor identity and then only he can act so well as a beggar on stage. He can happily forget it because he knows it can never be lost. It's his identity, it's permanently available to him. And the master said, you the pure consciousness, know yourself to be the pure consciousness. Don't think yourself to be the pure consciousness. If you think yourself to the pure consciousness, you know what's happening when we say we must hold on to that. It's the mind thinking that way that I want to be pure consciousness. That's a nice thing to be. The mind can never be pure consciousness. The body can never be pure consciousness. The pure consciousness is you all the time and you can never be anything else. You don't have to try to be pure consciousness. You don't have to hold on to the idea that you're pure consciousness. Indeed, Ashtavakra tells us, your only bondage is that you're trying to get liberation. Actually, literally, he says, your only bondage is you're trying to get samadhi. If you're pure consciousness, if you're Brahman, does Brahman need samadhi? No, absolutely not. That's the level at which, from which Ashtavakra speaks. You see, sometimes... Just yesterday, somebody was asking me in San Diego, why do the Vedanta teachers start off with the most difficult? The logical thing is to explain the easiest and then the next one and the next one. It's because the Vedanta teachers don't think in terms of difficult and easy. They think in terms of direct and indirect. 
Why should I waste your time? Ashtavakra thinks, let me give you the whole truth, the, the inside truth right now straight away and tell you, you are Brahman, you are pure consciousness. Abide in that, my friend. Looks at you carefully. Are you feeling enlightened? No? No? No, no? All right. Let's try this. And he pulls out a book on meditation. If you're not feeling enlightened, I'll tell you, my friend, what you do is sit quietly. And I'll tell you how to sit and how to breathe and how to concentrate. Calm the lake of the mind. Then what I was talking about will become eventually clear to you. Working? Now I, f I feel sleepy when I meditate. <laughs> okay, my friend. Let's try this one. There is God. And just have faith in this. I'm telling you. God exists. In Vedanta, the pure consciousness itself is God. God exists. If you cannot understand that you are not the body, you think you are the body, you are this person. Very good. We can start there. You are a person. Imagine there is a God which creates all of this. And that God loves you, wants you to attain liberation and happiness. Believe in this God. Pray to this God. Worship this God. Surrender to this God. Keep your mind on this God. Okay, I can run with that. Yeah. All right. Good luck to you. The thing with Ashtavakra is he only is there. <laughs> he does not come down to the level of even meditation or this practice or that practice or this faith or that faith. No. The clear truth is available to us. Here it is. Abide in it. Then he says, next thing. We've only gone halfway through the verse. Imagine, it's only one verse. But I'll run through it fast and then we have a question answer so we can go through more of that later on. The next word is right now. Is liberation possible right now? Is enlightenment possible right now? Is freedom possible right now? Or does it take a lot of time? Almost all of us are convinced it takes a lot of time because we have read of the lives of uh, uh, great spiritual practitioners who meditated and meditated for years and years and years, who struggled so hard. So we think it's a long journey there. How long does it take for the wave to become water? How long does it take for this lectern to become wood? Not long at all. Instantaneously, all that you have to do to become enlightened is to know that you are pure consciousness. Just that. Step aside internally and in your understanding from the body-mind complex and see that you are ever the unchanging witness of the body-mind and right now you have freedom. It's possible right here, right now. Ashtavakra is an impatient man. He says that this is an extraordinary thing is available to us all the time. Then why wait for it? He does not believe in a post-mortem real spirituality. After death, you will go to a place, nice place called heaven and that's the goal. No, no, no. Not interested. I'm not signing up for that. <laughs> Vivekananda, when he came to this country, remember to the end of the 19th century, a very different country at that time, he shocked and scandalized people by saying, I have not come here to teach you how to go to heaven. In fact, I have come here how to, to teach you how to stop going to heaven. <laughs> because you know the Hindu idea that once we consider ourselves to be an individual being, a jiva, in this body, as the body dies, then we actually do go to another place Depending on our karma, we go to heaven or some other place like that. And then from there, we are reborn again in the body. And this cycle continues. Birth and death cycle continues. The understanding of moksha, of liberation, is the stopping of this birth and death cycle. In Vivekananda's words, stopping going to heaven. Give up this habit of going to heaven and hell and back to earth again. Stop that. Adunaiva, right now, it is possible. When the penny drops, understanding, and you get it. What is the nature of this liberation? Sukhi Shanta. Ultimate bliss, we'll talk about that later. And, pure, uh, and, and peace. Shanta means peace. It literally means, peace means overcoming suffering. Attainment of permanent bliss. The, the joy unspeakable. You see, when you talk about 
a cycle of births and deaths and that has to stop and that is liberation. Many people, especially in this country, you're brought up in Abrahamic traditions, you might say, I don't believe in all that many lives and maybe I do not believe in it. I only see this one life. Can you redefine liberation for me? So Vedanta redefines liberation as forget the cycle of births and deaths. Right now, can I transcend my sufferings? I'm using the word very carefully, transcend my sufferings. And can I attain to permanent joy and peace and happiness? Yes, and that is liberation. Bandha mukta, free from bondage. You will be free from bondage. Just a couple of lines and I'll end. What do you mean by free from bondage? What is freedom and what is bondage? The traditional idea, the beginner's idea, what we are taught in Vedanta and what Ashtavakra is saying, they're two different things. No, note this. The beginner's idea of freedom and bondage in Vedanta is like this. I am an individual being. I have my, a load of past karma on me. Because of my past karma, I am born in this. I am now Swami Sarva Priyananda and I inhabit this world and I have good and bad experiences floating to me on the stream of time because of my past karma. And this game will go on until I attain liberation, until I'm one with Brahman, and then I will, there will be no further births, no further deaths, that is liberation. That's how we understand in Vedanta. Ashtavakra says, kindergarten stuff. <laughs> That's not how it is. What is the truth then? Ashtavakra says, not like that. You already are liberated. There were no past births, there will be no future births. There is not even this present birth. You already are liberated. You only own up to it. You come into a consciousness of it. You come to an understanding of it that I ever have been liberated. I am liberated and I always remain liberated. Liberation, moksha is my real nature. I have never fallen from that state, nor will I ever fall from that state. It's not a state, it's the only reality that is. The thing is, what will happen after liberation? Do I suddenly feel that I was in bondage, I suffered so many lives, phew, I'm, I am glad that's all over and done with, now I'm going to have a vacation. Is that liberation? Ashtavakra says, no, no, no. When you are liberated, you will clearly see you have never been in bondage. The highest truth, there's nobody in bondage, there's nobody who attains freedom, there's nobody who is struggling to attain freedom. It's all one consciousness and a play in that consciousness. You are that one consciousness. Just one verse. It's just the op one of the opening verses in Ashtabhakra. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu